Welcome to this video lecture on the overall job creation process, which is a critical feature under the heading of Applied Performance Practices. Good managers are capable of designing and redesigning jobs for employees to match the employee's KSAOs, or knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics, while maximizing the customer experience and making a profit. That's a tall task indeed. However, this tutorial on applied performance practices will focus on the complete job creation process, from job analysis to job redesign. Before a manager can redesign a job, they have to know what the duties and tasks of the job actually are. You'd be surprised how little some direct supervisors know about their subordinates' jobs. Let's get started. This is the job creation process flow from job analysis to job redesign and all points in between. This video will dissect this model into its constituent parts. There are some recommended formal steps in the job analysis process, which yields the job description and job specification. Those two things then lead to the process of job design. From job design, we move to job performance, which then leads to job redesign. Job redesign should be a never-ending duty that has a feedback loop to job performance. As managers see job performance and its related variables like employee motivation and job satisfaction wax and wane, they should engage in modifications to the job by rearranging its relationship to other jobs in the company and revising the duties of the job. The process of creating jobs and assigning people to positions is based on job analysis which is the study of what people do in their jobs by determining the specific duties, tasks, or activities of the job. A manager cannot redesign or design a job until they know what the job incumbent actually does in the job. The first step is to perform a job analysis. Let's move on. Managers must first figure out what it takes to produce a good or service. With this information, they design jobs and assign positions. Let's follow the creation of a new restaurant that focuses on making and serving high-quality food in a pleasant environment. This requires the hiring of a kitchen staff and a wait staff. The manager needs jobs like chef, assistant chef, food runner, wait staff, hostess, assistant manager, and janitorial crew. These jobs are assigned a certain number of positions, such as 10 wait staff, two hostesses, three assistant managers, etc. The process of creating jobs and assigning people to positions is based on job analysis, which is the study of what people do in their jobs by determining the specific duties, tasks, or activities of the job. A manager cannot design or redesign a job until they know what the incumbent does. The first step is job analysis. To perform a job analysis is actually quite fun. It's not much fun to study, so hang in there. It's incredibly useful stuff and essential to a sound organization. Here are the steps in job analysis. The first step is to figure out which job you want to study. So let's pick our food server. The second step is to determine what information you want to collect. Well, let's focus on tasks, responsibilities, and skills of a food server. The third step is to identify from whom you will get data about the job. The most common sources are the food servers and their supervisors. Some of the data that you will seek to acquire include the relative importance of the task, responsibilities, and skills. For example, you might want to measure the amount of time spent on each task and then estimate the criticality of error. Think about this last one for a minute. The most critical part of a food server's job is to get the customer's order correct, right? Or is it to refill their drinks in a timely manner? Or is it getting the check total correct? It could be any of those things or other things. The fourth step is the determination of exactly how you will collect this data. You could use interviews with incumbents and their managers or administer questionnaires, conduct direct observation of the food server and the performance of their job, etc. Your job analysis has determined that the tasks include taking customer orders, filling drinks, and serving food. The responsibilities include treating customers in a friendly manner, writing and remembering orders correctly, handling cash and credit card transactions. The skills include having a pleasant demeanor, 
handling a fast-paced environment, basic memory skills, and basic math skills. The fifth step is to evaluate the data collected. Sometimes employees will inflate or downplay the importance of some of their tasks, responsibilities, and skill requirements. This is sometimes done to jockey for a pay increase or to minimize the time spent on some unsavory duties or to simply reinforce the sense of self-importance. We mainly evaluate and verify this data with information from other employees who do the same job and we validate it with their managers. For example, suppose a food server consistently gives the incorrect change to patrons. And in order to make this part of their job less important, they provide false information about the criticality of this error. Their inability to do basic math might have cost the restaurant some valuable customers who vowed never to come back. But the server wants to downplay that. The sixth and last step is to write the job analysis report. This is where the analyst actually details the information gathered and the restaurant can now decide how much to pay each job, what sorts of selection tests to give each job applicant, what type of training job incumbents will need in order to perform well, etc. It all starts with job analysis. It's boring to study, but it's fun to do. Just ask someone you know if they'll spend a few minutes telling you what they actually do in their job. They'll usually light up with a big smile. Sometimes you can't shut them up. Job analysis has two important end products, the job description and the job specification. Let's move on. After the job analysis report is written, a manager can develop the job description and job specification. We can think of the former as things that incumbents do on the job, and we can think of the latter as things they must bring to the job before they perform it. In reality, both job descriptions and job specifications are listed in the same document most of the time. In fact, a description has at least four parts. First is the job title, like food server, welder, college professor, or YouTube star. Then it has a section called the job identification, which lists the location where the job is performed, to whom the incumbent reports, and even a code for that job that can be found on ONET. ONET is the first place to start for small businesses with not so deep pockets. Then is the list of essential functions or duties. This is the list of things that the incumbent actually does as part of the job. These should only be the essential functions and not aspects of the job done by some people some of the time. These are things for which people get paid, so they play a huge role in the performance appraisal process later. Also, you may violate the Americans with Disabilities Act if you fail to provide a reasonable accommodation for someone with a disability who needs the accommodation to perform the essential duties. The list of proper essential duties can sometimes become a legal issue. Lastly, we have the job specifications, which is a list of the KSAOs, the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics needed to perform the job. Going back to the food server position, these might include an outgoing personality, basic math skills, cash, cash handling experience, good memory, and multitasking abilities. Let's move on. Next, we turn to job design. After we've developed the description and job specifications, we design the jobs that they do. Job design involves things that are much different than job analysis. Job design involves the amount of supervision provided, the amount and type of feedback provided, the level of decision input allowed, etc. There are four inputs to consider for job design. The first is the objectives or strategy of the organization. For example, if the company wants to become the low cost leader in prepared food sales, it better focus on logistics, warehousing, and bargaining with wholesalers. If it wants to use a market differentiation strategy and develop a fine dining experience with exotic food, then it should focus on paying very talented employees a lot of money and spending even more money on accoutrements and ambiance than their competitors. 
The second is industrial engineering. Here, the firm should focus on the relationship between the various jobs. For the food server job, the manager must decide on the flow of product from chef to sous chef to food runner to food server or some such. These are all designed to maximize efficiency. A third input is ergonomic concerns that involve the design of equipment and the placement of tools. This is the domain of human factor engineers, and their primary concern is a balance between safety and efficiency. The manager must consult with subject matter experts on placement of the drink filling station, silverware and napkin folding area, installation of non-slip floors in heavily trafficked areas, etc. The fourth input is employee input. These involve behavioral concerns like type and degree of human interaction and other factors contributing to employee satisfaction. Based upon the experience of food servers at previous restaurants, the manager may design the job to have either more or less interaction with the kitchen staff or have more or less interaction with customers even. A manager's goal is to design jobs that appeal to employees and that maximize their motivation, performance, and satisfaction while meeting the needs of the organization. Let's move on. Well, it doesn't end with job performance. After manager has designed the jobs and assessed employee job performance, they need to occasionally consider redesigning the jobs. Good managers are willing to redesign the jobs to meet changing market conditions and to both maximize employee performance and appeal to applicants and employees. For example, if the manager notices an increase in the rate of turnover in the food server job, then that job might need to be redesigned. Some design changes could include amendments to the tasks, duties, and responsibilities of the job. There may be too much side work, as they call it in the restaurant business, that gets in the way of actually waiting on tables and earning tips. That is, the side work, like folding napkins, bussing tables, etc., is limiting the earnings of food servers. This is leading to increased employee turnover. That's a management problem. A good manager has to find out why the food servers are quitting in large numbers and, if possible, redesign the job. Let's move on. Again, here's the whole job process model. Methods of intervention in the feedback loop at the far right will be discussed next. Let's move on. After a manager has designed the jobs, they need to occasionally consider redesigning the jobs. Every organizational problem is a management problem. Suppose a restaurant has such high turnover that the manager has to find out why the food servers are quitting in large numbers. They can use the job characteristics model to diagnose many such problems. The JCM, as it's known, is a model designed to allow managers to maximize positive job attitudes and behaviors and minimize negative ones. The JCM suggests that core job characteristics can lead to one or more critical psychological states, which in turn leads to some favorable outcomes. There are core job characteristics that managers must learn to vary for different incumbents in different jobs at different times. The first is skill variety, which is simply the type and number of skills that employees get to use every day. Perhaps the restaurant has taken job specialization to the extreme, and one food server only serves drinks, another one only takes orders, another one only brings the food, etc. If they only do one thing in the food serving process, that can get very boring. If they get to do five or ten things, that can prove to be much more interesting. Good managers design jobs that allow for the different talents of the employee to be utilized within reason. The second is task identity, which is the degree to which a job requires the completion of a whole and identifiable piece of work. Good managers allow employees to follow a job from beginning to end within reason, allowing a food server to engage in the entire range of tasks, such as taking orders, serving drinks, delivering food, etc., allows them to see how what they do in their job contributes to a whole service. The third is task significance, 
which is the degree to which a job has an impact on the company or the lives of others. Knowing that the food and drinks being served satisfies a customer's special occasion, like a birthday or an anniversary, and that they were part of that celebration can be quite important. The fourth job characteristic is autonomy, which is the degree to which restaurant managers allow food servers to decide how to perform the job. Again, within reason, the food server may be able to give extra dinner rolls or provide a free drink every now and then if the situation calls for it, if they have autonomy. The fifth characteristic is feedback from the job, which is the provision of clear and unambiguous information from the job itself, not feedback from a manager. A food server gets reliable and accurate feedback in the amount of tips they earn. If the restaurant pools all tips and customers place the tips in a jar by the cashier on the way out, they may never know if the customer thinks they are doing a good job or not. Knowing that one's performance is acceptable at all times is a good thing. These things on which the manager can vary most jobs then lead to three psychological states. The first is the experience of the meaningfulness of the work performed. It should be easy to see how knowing that one's performance put a special, a special smile on the face of the birthday girl at her family's celebration. Birthdays are quite meaningful to most people, and a good food server performing a well-designed job can experience that firsthand. The second is the responsibility for work outcomes. Having high levels of autonomy and maximum discretion to decide how one does the job provides a tremendous sense of responsibility for making the right decisions. A good food server is responsible for making good decisions. The third psychological state is knowledge of the results of the work performed. Having on the job automatic feedback provides near instantaneous knowledge of how well one is doing. A frown or a scowl or a mean comment from a restaurant customer provides immediate knowledge to the food server on how they're doing. Bad reviews on Yelp or some other website can really help one figure out where they went wrong in the food serving process. These three critical states then result in the important outcomes of increased intrinsic motivation, improved work performance, and high job satisfaction. Think about it for a minute. If one's job is meaningful and one is responsible for their own performance and they know immediately how well they are doing, that can be a very, very good thing. It can lead to higher levels of satisfaction, motivation, and performance. In short, it makes jobs better. A good manager makes everyone's job better. A well-designed job decreases turnover, counterproductive work behavior, and the need to constantly find new customers because of bad employees. Let's move on. Here are some tips for business practitioners. First, every manager must understand the duties, tasks, responsibilities, as well as the required KSAOs of the jobs they supervise. It is unbelievable but true that too many managers look upward and outward when they should be looking inward and downward to fix the firm's problems. Lower level jobs are the foundation of the company and a good manager knows what goes into them. Second, a manager must develop job descriptions of all positions in the company. If an employee does not have a job description, then how does the manager develop the performance appraisal? A performance appraisal should cover all of the essential duties in a job description. Far too many employees are surprised to find out what it is that matters in their performance appraisal. There should be no surprises between subordinate and supervisors regarding the proper conduct of the duties of the job. Third, a manager must be willing to redesign a job. If an employee is not satisfied or motivated to perform well, a good manager asks them how the job should or could be done to make them satisfied and motivated. When changes to the design of the job are within reason, it is likely to improve the performance of the subordinate and by extension of the company. Fourth, all problems are management problems. Companies don't make decisions, people do. 
The people who make decisions in companies are managers and failure to take responsibility or to be willing to make changes are the sign of ineptitude or fear. A good manager takes the blame. When they do that, they sometimes then get the credit for success. Taking the good with the bad, the blame with the credit, is the hallmark of integrity. Fifth, good managers focus on positions in their firm. Some positions have multiple people holding them. Thus, positions are comprised by jobs. If a manager does not know what the position entails or how the job is done, then they cannot expect to understand the failures and successes of the business. It actually starts at the bottom, not the top. An understanding of the big picture is good, but a clear view of the lower level machinations leads to success. Let's move on. Thanks. That's all, folks.